All righty. Welcome to Otter Talk number 19, helpful gear and equipment for you and your otter hound. I appreciate y'all coming. Um, we had one question um, on email ahead of time, and I'm going to go ahead and address that so I don't forget. And to thank Marie, because she is responsible for this Otter Talk, because way long time ago on a Zoom meeting of some sort, Marie said, I really need to have an Otter Talk on helpful gear and know what y'all use. So Marie, that is thanks to you. I appreciate that. Um, and Marie's question was about her one and a half year old male marking everything and wants to know if um, belly bands work or neutering helps or so. Marie, go ahead and tell us your problem. Oh, You're unmute. Good. Unmute yourself first, though. Okay, so um, Merlin tends to be excitable when you take him someplace new. And um, any place I take him, he proceeds to mark. Even if I have let him walk around and sniff and mark three, four times before we go into the place. And I have to keep him literally at my side or he will lift his leg on anything that he chooses to. So like I would love to do nose works with him or rally with him, but I can't because he will go around and pee on everything. I had a male at our home before, he never lifted his leg, but this guy, well, he just thinks he should pee on everything. And when he does it, I pull him back and give him a no mark, no command, but I mean, he's gonna do it no matter what. I could use some help guys, any suggestions? So all of you longtime male otter hound owners or breeders, let's help Murray out with some suggestions. Ashka, I bet you have some help. Well, for good or for bad, um, I only had have one boy. And he used to mark more when he was younger. I did take him to nose work and he did mark, uh, I think it was a chair. Um, what oh seemed to help oh is, um, you know, in the nose work situation, you wait for your turn to go in the ring or in the search area. Right before when I knew that, you know, there were two dogs ahead of me, I would take him to pee and mark everything he could think sure. of. And then we would go in and he only had an, I'm not going to call it even an accident because for him, it wasn't an accident, but he marked only one time. Okay. Um, now that he's 11, he still marks a lot, but it seems to be more under control. It could be his, you know, I'm young and dominant and I own the whole world. Um, I don't have a solution though, because for good or for bad, I only have one boy. Right. But Bev just left. She's got boys everywhere. So maybe she has some okay. practical advice. I never used any kind of belts or anything like that right. for him because just never had the need. Right. We have used a belly band for a dog, a male dog that um, was doing that. And it didn't stop him from peeing, but it kept the okay. pee from getting on what you didn't want it to get on. So it's it's half of a solution it didn't, didn't ever That's stop him from peeing, but okay well, it's my, neighbor's couch. my three boys have um no history of marking <clears throat> however however um when we would go in the ring <clears throat> with barley uh who had the nose of the century and if there was a bitch in heat anywhere he would um, want to react to it. And somebody once said to me, try putting some peppermint extract on, around his nose before you go into the ring. Um, not, you know, let him walk around freely until then and, and pee is to his heart's content wherever he can. But okay. once in the ring, that little bit of peppermint extract would just dis discourage him. Uh, it would it would mask 
the immediate scent nearby. Okay, I'll try that. As I didn't know if neutering him, I mean, he's gonna be two over the summer and you know, we're going to eventually neuter him, but I didn't know if I should neuter him right when he's two to break him of the marking habit or, you know, I mean, it's funny. It seems like you either get a hound that doesn't do it or you get a hound that does do it. And I have no experience with this leg lifting everywhere. I mean, I'd love to bring him in, show him, but I'd be afraid he'd pee on the judge. You know, if the judge smelled like a dog, that would be, I could I would see that see happening. It. Pardon me? I want to see it. A dog pee on the judge. It would be fabulous. I'm just uh, yeah, kidding. well, it, it very well could be Merlin. You know? <laughs> hey, Bev, do you have any boy advice on marking? Uh, um, I'm still working on mine. Uh, I had a boy many, many years ago without this problem, but I have three boys in the house right now. And once in a while, they're not as bad. They don't mark in the house anymore, but <clears throat> I don't have problems with them marking in a building either. I don't know, maybe because I keep them on a tight leash. I, I don't have too much to offer. <laughs> I'm looking to hear as well. Okay. So I don't really have advice necessarily about boys, but I do do a sport with my Airedales called barn hunt and right. they are not eat in the ring whatsoever, male, female, anything. And being um, part of a club and being part of a club that holds trials, we have to be super aware of that. So what some trainers for barn hunt will suggest is it's all hay bales. So they'll put out a hay bale. And it's kind of like a teaser. And if the dog goes to lift their leg, it's a no and you drag them away from it right, right. away. So you make sure it's always going to be, that's a, a negative response. And right. then a positive, they go where you want them to go. Right. So that's what nose work that you want to do, he's got to learn that in that nose work environment, that's never going to be an okay thing. Right. Well, you know, even like going for CGC, anything, I mean, He's, I, even when I take him to get his nails ground, if they leave him off leash, he'll find a spot to bless. You know, it's like, ah, oh, Merlin. Thankfully he's only done it once in the house and I caught him in the act and gave him a nice firm no and we haven't had a repeat of that, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty ingrained habit right now and uh, you know, even we go for obedience, you know, I've got him right next to me because if he sniffs anything, he's going to pee on it. Well, maybe what you could try is introduce him to the we are working or let's work command to differentiate from we are walking around and you can pee versus we are doing something that matters and we are working right now. Therefore, you you don't pee. Okay. And just, you know, start with the very small area and very short duration, literally 30 seconds ago. Okay, let's, let's work. Okay, great. Let's go pee. Okay. And then extend that working uh, period and working area, right? So you don't create new comments if it's a confirmation or barn hunt or whatever. It's either working or okay. pee, right? Okay. And reward him for peeing on command per se and reward him for working without peeing on command. So that would be just my generic ad hoc idea. Okay, we'll try it. I'm willing to try anything because, uh, you know, he's got to learn to stop doing that, you know, and he's, let's just say adolescence has hit him hard. He's, you know, quite a determined young man. It we have we have a friend it's not our dog but we have a friend that we've shown with for a long time and she had uh, a dog that had this trouble and she had to teach him not here so whether she was at confirmation or centra or whatever she'd have to tell him you know not here and that meant you can't be so right. she thought might she would say not here and he knew that he would be corrected if he did 
and she it took her a while but she had him to the point where he was pretty good we were at a sun trial okay. once and the dog right ahead of him peed in the trial area so she was so worried that he would sure. also pee on top of that dog and um so with her not here she made it through but he was a notorious pee on something that you didn't want him to pee on so that that's another option too like really reinforce where he can't go and okay. where he can that's just another okay thought. thank you guys i'll yeah. give it a go yeah do you have any other questions about equipment or gear or anything like that marie um uh no um we seem you know we're we're like loaded up on everything i have found uh merlin is a notorious killer and gutter uh, heaven help him if he catches that squirrel in the yard that's been swearing at him in squirrel. Uh, so I have found a line of, and I'll share this with you guys if you have a gutter. Uh, it's a Kong toy that is unstuffed. And so when they rip open the material, there's a rope inside. And so you don't have to worry about the dog eating the stuffing. Uh, you know, he's got, he's got the rope to chew. So, you know, that's something I found. I mean, I'm still, I'm still battling with drummling the nails. Uh, he just, he goes every two weeks to the groomer and gets his nails. He gets brushed out and nails because I want him to be able to behave if he has to go to a groomer. And uh, he's been doing this since we got him either every week or every two weeks, and he's still fighting the Dremel. So I've been working more on trying to desensitize him, but the minute he sees that Dremel, he heads for, you know, some place to hide. It so, could be the sound. It is the sound. It's the sound of the whir of the, because I can, if the Dremel is not on, I can put it on his paw, he'll sniff it, he'll go by it. But the minute that whir goes on, he takes off. Do you have multiple speeds on it? Yes, I have a low so and, and a with high. high dogs, when we start dremeling, well, it's with the first dog. When I start dremeling with the first dog, usually other dogs are around. Right. Everybody's ears go up and I put the speed on the, on the lowest possible level. So it's really not that intense. Okay. And then I start dremeling and then every few seconds I just raise it up okay and then eventually it's on the speed that i need it on but they got used to the increasing speed and they don't you know they don't move okay so, good idea good and idea. i no longer reward them after every paw but you know you can right. you can get them there but you you can even just turn on the dremel and have treats and don't right. dremel the nails just do the noise thing I've been doing that and he still takes off. I mean, it's just, I don't know if, uh, you know, if when he was a little, little guy before I got him, if he just got spooked by it or what, but it's, it's been a, nails have been an issue. So like I said, I take him every two weeks and the groomer, which he needs to get used to anyway, you know, does his, his nails for me. We have had pretty good luck with a little bit of CBD oil, too, for our dogs that are really um, hesitant about getting their nails dremel. That has been a huge help for us. Um, anybody else have any nail trimming advice? So I'll just jump in real quick. I could not do General's nails at all when General arrived. And it took four men and four boys to hold him down. And so it just, I have to tell you, it's a, it's a war that you just have to keep at and keep right. at and keep at. And I think that to me is the bottom line. Now, I just pick him up and say, okay, it's nail time. And he's like, zoom, zoom. But it, it that did not happen overnight by any means. So, you know, I think just be patient. That's the only thing right. I can say and do the reward when it's all done that this was a good thing and you did live through this. So hang in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
the no, CBD the, the CBD does work really good. It just we get we give Ellie a little CBD about 20 minutes. You know, we'll do another dog's nails or two dogs' nails, and then do Ellie's, and she's just calm enough where it doesn't take you know half an army to hold her down and do it. She'll just stand on the table and pretty much let you do her nails. And then she goes back to her chair and sits and, but that otherwise it's, you couldn't, I can't hold her while Robin does her nails if we don't do that. So I, I'm a big proponent of CBD oil. Yeah, and so, we've actually been using that method for probably two years now, I would say, uh -huh. Charlie, is that, would you say about two yeah, years? Uh, yeah, CBD? at least. Um, and now she's very, very good about it. She just hands you her paw. She's like, okay. Um, where before it was, it was miserable for all three of us. Is so there a particular us. kind of CBD oil you use? Um, I use a product from Innovet, I-N-N-O-V-E-T. Okay. And they have different strengths from 125 to like 3000, which is for horses. So you might want to start with like a 250. Okay. Um, and then you have to experiment a little bit with the dosage because um, some dogs are real sensitive to it and others are not. Um, we use uh, CBD oil for um, seizures as well in, an, in another dog. And uh, so we have a stronger dosage for that dog. Um, we usually use 750 for that dog. And of the 750, it only takes, I would say about three drops. Okay. Um, so like in a 250, that might, that would equiv be equivalent to like nine drops or like a third of a dropper. So you do okay. have to experiment a little bit, but I've been, um, I really like Innovet a lot for their products. Okay. You don't get the strength that you, they say you are, have, and it's not pure and you don't have all of the credentials behind it where Innovet has been, we've had really good luck with that. We've used it for uh, many years, probably four years, five years with that. Okay. I think I'm going to go to that route next. Why That's not? Perfect. Why not? Yeah, let me know how that goes. No, uh, anybody else have any questions on nails or coat or grooming? What anybody uses or has had sex success with? I have well, one thing I, that I, I have a um, an ongoing issue with Gable. He loves to be brushed. He absolutely adores it. We even have a nighttime ritual where, where I brush him. However, I can go only as far as his hips. He absolutely detests anything behind through. his hips. Trying to get through. His thighs, his I, I legs, know. his tail. Um, his, he will give me his feet, but... Yeah. Um, he will sit on the table or on the floor and, um, you know, we weigh almost the same thing right now and I cannot hold him up and brush him at the same time. I have no problems with anything in the front. He loves it. He, I mean, he comes to me when he's ready to be brushed, but beyond that, especially when, you know, I give him a bath and, and I want to groom him fully. It is really, really tough. And you know, since his showing days are over, um, I've let it be uh, more him in control of me. <clears throat> um, but when I, I don't have anybody else to help me with that, um, I've tried using two, um, you know, the one, one head restraint and one around his hips. Right. Um, he'll, pull, he'll pull the grooming arm right off the table when he sits. Yeah. I can't, I can't get him to um, participate with me. I, th I think I'm going to end up having to go back to uh, regular grooming, but in between, I still have, I mean, he's nine years old. You'd think he'd figure it out by now. No. Um, do, you, do you have one of those um, lick mats that you can stick on like your refrigerator or a sliding glass door? They're circular and you could put like some really high value thing in it, like liver sausage, or if your dog is a yogurt nut or canned dog food, a really 
good canned dog food and you stick it up and then the dog licking is calming for a dog. They're licking away on the lick mat and he might let you start taking the brush to his hind quarter. And, you know, even if you just did it once or twice and he's licking on that mat, he's then making the association that, hey, I get the lick mat if she, if I let her brush me and he's not, you know, really restrained, which he's probably fighting against anyway. Or the other thing I can suggest is don't brush, try just combing. Maybe for some reason the brush back there is bothering him. I know like Merlin, I can take out three different brushes and he will fight me. But if I take out a comb and I comb him, he will let me do it anywhere. So, you know, otter hounds are goofy. You know, maybe he just doesn't like that brush on his hind quarter or try the, the lick mat because then he's making a positive association if he only gets that lick mat when you're brushing his rear. Yeah, I think I'm uh, able to do that when he's on the table and then I have to figure out where I would put it. Oh. But that, that's a good, um, it's a good starting point. Um, um, I have a recommendation as well. Yeah. Um, I would say instead of starting grooming at the front and the head, start with the rear and then go to the front and then go to the rear and then go to the front. So he's rewarded. Right. The other thing that I have an old dog and she prefers just to lay on the floor and I sit on the floor and groom her. Yeah. So those are my two tips. That's what I've resorted to, but I can't, I can't do that much at any given time. Um, I don't have the agility <laughs> to do that at my age. And, um, and my dog I doesn't do what like I it. can do. Yeah, Does my dog, dog puts up with it. So okay. only short periods of time can I brush her out. Does your dog lay on the couch or on the bed? Yeah, but when I start brushing him um, and do it that way, he has he has limited patience with it. And I mean, the same thing is true if, I, if I'm brushing him on his front, he doesn't want to lie down that long and do it. Yeah. Um, it's just, it, it's a matter of uh, Gable's will against Marilyn's will. Uh, I, know, I, I can understand that, Marilyn. I, uh, to brush Merlin, I have to do it like four different times during the day. I do his head, I do one paw, I go away, he's laying on the floor, I do the backside. He's laying on the couch. I do the other side. I mean, yeah, yeah. They're so their own. Sarah, Sarah yeah. has had that experience with him a couple of times, and she knows what I'm talking about. He is, yeah. he's, he's just, he's the most wonderful dog in the world. I adore him. His personality is beyond measure. But this is the one area in which we consistently disagree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to make, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. No, I, I also think with these um, particular coats that we have on these dogs, especially that litter, I, you know, kind of think at some point in time, we have to resolve to taking it off because if they dislike it that much, I think a happy home is, um, much better home in my view and so if I had to tackle that with an, an unhappy dog I'd finally say then you know what you don't need it because um, you know you can take them down such that you still have coat left you know we're not doing a terrier strip <laughs> on them but um, so you know at some point Marilyn you may just have to say I don't want to fight the battle and yeah. I um I support that wholeheartedly because General got, uh, when we were in uh, Kansas, he got these little needles and they just wove into his legs. And I was practically in tears. And Michael Brantley said, okay, Sarah, you're fighting and fighting. Let's just take the hair off. And quite honestly, it grew back. Uh, General didn't care. Um, he was much happier. But um, I think you might want to have kind of 
that conversation with yourself to say, are we ready for that? And for those who don't know, General and Gable are brothers. Because, it, yeah, and so they have the same beautiful coats. They have <laughs> a lot of it, a lot of it. But at some point, you have to just say, that's okay. I know what our breed standard says, but for goodness sakes, they're not going into the show ring. So a happy home is a much happier home. Yeah, I appreciate that, Sarah. Thanks. So I think you get to that. Yeah. So my Aussie trained me because it wasn't definitely me training him. What matters to him that his hair is not pulled and it really doesn't matter where on his body as long as I'm not pulling, he's okay. So it took me a long time to where I'm at right now, but I would literally, if there was an area that he didn't like, um, I would just take a little section with the comb and say, hey, it's not pulling, is that okay? And he'd be like, okay. And then we would move on to the part, body part that was not pulling. And then I would go back to where it was pulling. So now he kind of understands, but let me tell you at 11 years old, if it pulls, he looks at me like, how dare you? <laughs> so that doesn't change, but it's all about the pulling. Okay, so comments on, on the pulling. Um, what I do with my dogs is if I have a mat I have to pull out or something, I always put my fingers in between the comb and the skin, and yeah. then I comb it out, and then there's less pressure on the dog. Yep. Yeah, I hold on, on above the tangled area and really right. use, uh, Sarah, your paper clip or one I, of the, um, uh, I have the, the rakes, but the, I'm really yeah. slow. And just breaking it out, making sure that it doesn't pull. It's kind of like the knots they get under here. Yes. And as uh, soon as you take a comb to it and it doesn't come out, they're like, what have you done? So I have to tell you, that's that one secret weapon you keep in your tack box is a letter opener to say, mm -hmm. I'm going to just be really careful. And it really keeps you from going too close. But oh my gosh, the letter opener. Once I found that tool, I was like the best ever. A letter opener? We, yes. we have a little... We, it's we a, have a, I'll grab it. I think I have it handy. We have a little mat knife that's like kind of J-shaped and it's got a blade in right. it and you just slide it in and it cuts right through. And that works really good. I mean, yeah. I, honestly, yeah. we don't use it very often, but Ellie doesn't get too matted up. It's Yeah, it's kind of like that, but it's your natural right. like dog yours is kind of a hook yeah yeah can you exactly see? because a, a i can tool. see my camera my camera is weird. oh yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Well, yours is made for dogs so it's a little bit less plastic so it's just like an l so it has the yeah. little tiny blade part you can it just does of... have a little blade in here yep. Yep. so you got to be careful but you can just hook it and brush through yeah yep. we, yeah we have one Whoa. It, it's the same principle, just a it's a metal tool instead of a plastic one would be the only yes. difference, really. Okay, matte knife. I think we had some of those in a hospitality bag at one of our specialties a few yeah. years ago, specifically for that reason, not for you to open your mail. I didn't know what it was for. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. <laughs> you have oh. one, see? It says <laughs> national specialty. Now I know. Huh. <laughs> yeah, that's a great tool. Yeah. Especially for beards where they don't like having you messing in there. Um, well, any other beards? I use scissors. You know, yeah. if it's somewhere here and it doesn't want to come out, I will just cut it. Yeah. Same thing with between the toes. Yeah, they get those are very important. You know, um, I don't know. Well, if Cindy was here, she would tell you that I'm obsessed with feet. But but mats on the pads and in between the toes, they walk weird. They chew their feet. Yes. And uh, little scissors yep. make a huge difference. I also another thing, and I don't know if anybody has those issues talking about shaggy dogs. Bella is my dog with a lot of undercoat and a lot of soft undercoat. 
and she produces huge amounts of hair inside her ears. <sighs> and I used to battle ear infections until we started going to the vet and pulling out the hair from inside the ear canal. That's probably the only thing, well, in anal glands, that I don't do on my dogs because it's just, I can't watch my dog crying. But all our issues were with ear infection solved once we started pulling the hair out. Uh, and up. I do it every two months at the most okay. because if I wait any longer, they literally pull out matted sticks that long of just the hair out of the ear. So, okay. so yeah, dogs so with too much pow it's ear, um, I'd recommend you buy the ear powder, put a little bit in, and you can pull out. Beth, Beth showed me, and I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> it. It doesn't hurt them when you put the ear powder in. So, dogs love it. I have to tell you, I agree with you, Bev. My problem is now with the arthritis in my hands, I can't grab anything. So right. I use um, what are Hemat the little the, the hematomas? Yeah, and just Hemat hair. Hemostats. 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 There we go. It's like I knew that word wasn't right, <laughs> but um, yeah, because my hands, I can't pull anything. So, but it if you put a little bit of chalk in there too, it'll make it easier on the dog with the hemostats. Yes. Yep. If Definitely. you are in my house, uh, yes, it works perfect. The moment you leave, I'm lost in the forest. Okay, so I know I'm invited back, huh? That's right. <laughs> we have um, dogs in our other breed. They have that have. Um, their inside of their ears is literally as hairy as the outside of their ears, where it's just thick, thick, thick. So you have to pluck it out to get air into the ear canal. And on those dogs, um, ear powder makes a huge difference. So we just put a little ear powder in and then start from the outside and work in. And, and actually they get used to it. And they actually, all of the ones I've done, because I groom a, a lot of them that are not mine, and they end up actually appreciating it and liking it and kind of like being like oh yeah do that again so <laughs> it it takes a it takes a little bit of consistency and you have to like kind of get them used to it but once they do get used to it doing it with either ear powder in your fingers or even if you have to use a hemostat because it's so deep or so big um the ear powder does help make it sticky enough to grab so that's a good good piece of advice bev Anybody else have any quest other questions about beards or ears? How do you get the dark brown stains out other than, I'm kidding, bleach. Uh, you know, we have <laughs> permanently dark stains. I've tried uh, Dawn dish detergent. I've tried whitening dog shampoo and it always looks like mucky, yucky mud. I, I don't think that the color is the issue is the slime or the dirt or, or the debris, right? So for those of you to know me, you're very surprised that I obsessively dry out and clean out that beard. Um, and then when I see sticky stuff, I use either Dawn or, or you know, dog shampoo and I just do it under the uh, hose outside. Right. But I don't worry about the color more about the debris and right. then every week on Sunday it's my moment of zen I groom the dogs and I brush out everything out of that beard because right. if I don't then it becomes sticky then it becomes stinky and then you know right something will grow there well I comb that beard out every single day so nice you know and I try to take even just a damp cloth and wipe it out because it'll get foul smelling if I don't but it's stained I mean it's, now, it's about the smell so I fairly recently and that's weird because I had otter hounds for just about 15 years there is like a little pocket over here that you kind of have to stretch and some of them like my Bella who has talents of getting her beard completely messed up there's a little pocket. If you, if you clean the whole beard, but not that pocket, 
Okay. You will have treasures in the pockets and it's a little folded on itself. Okay. But it's about right behind the canines. So it's about okay. here. So if he has deep pockets there, the smell might be coming out of there. Okay. And just so you know, Bella is the only one that has really deep those pockets. My others have them, just not that deep. Okay. I'll make sure to get in there and look. Clean. So would, I'll, I'll second what Ashka said. My roommate has a standard poodle and he has actually those really deep pockets mm -hmm. and the hair that grows out, like grows straight out because it's That's so right. full of gunk. So when we start smelling him, we just trim those back. We'll leave, you know, the rest of the little, he doesn't really have a okay. beard, hair and take those out. It smells completely different. Yep. And it's the moisture that grows the bacteria, right? Yeah. So yeah, it dry, it definitely helps. Yeah, it's all maroon colored in there and you can, because he's a white standard poodle, so you can see it. But if you even wipe out those with like a baby wipe, you'll right. see color come off on it. No, I never knew that. And we have lots of beards. Um, <laughs> one thing that we like for, we have beards in our whole house of dogs and big beards. And we like to, um, my favorite thing for drying beards we have a great big thick it's a car wash chamois um for every day we use just a regular bath towel but right. for like dog shows and stuff we have a really thick uh thick thick chamois and that works really great because all you have to do is just like hold them and talk to them a little bit give them a kiss on the nose and that really sucks up a lot of the moisture um so that helps a lot and we also use special bowls um that helps keep it keep their beards drier um, our favorite one is called a slopper stopper, where it has just a little hole. In fact, I have one. So we use something like this in the car, like just to have it in the car. And we use one like this. So it cool. has it has a stopper that comes out. Right. And then it has a hole that they lick from, but it keeps their beard dry from on the outside so you, you take you take the top off and then you fill it up and then you put that stopper in the top push the push the whole top down pull the stopper out and then it creates a vacuum so there's just water on the bottom so that's a favorite of ours that's the only bowl we use in the house anymore um, yeah that that works lake. really good yeah and it's expensive but it's worth it we have four of them and um I, amazon so, has it what amazon has it yeah they do Stopper, have, and often they're out of stock. And I have the link that I'm gonna um, share with everybody. Um, in fact, I have the link up that I can put it up. They come in either stainless or plastic. Um, for a long time, you couldn't get the stainless. So I was forced to get plastic when I needed to get a couple more. And I think the plastic worked just as well as the stainless. They get the, a little and the, scratched up over time, but. The hole look. in the middle is different sizes for different sized dogs. But what's nice is it's it only allows like you know less than an inch of water so there's not a lot of you know they can't if they're outside and you fill up a bowl of water they're wet from the ears forward so inside just a little bit of beard gets wet with with the slobber stoppers they're really they work really well yeah we like them a lot um and uh, use them, like I said, exclusively. Um, and you can get them either from Amazon or from their actual website, which is in a slopper with two Ps, not two Bs, slopper, stopper. Um, but that works really good. And then we also like in the car, use this little gizmo. So you can just yeah. squish it and have just the water come up in the, in the top rather than having them put their whole head in a, and Ellie's beard is the smallest beard in our house. So it's, Ellie is definitely not our, our beard problem. It's the other dogs. Um, so Chris, I noticed that you put a little note on the chat. Would you like to share those uh, items that you talked about? I have them up that I can share the links with if you want, but go ahead. And I was just typing a note to you that saying, would you like to talk about them? But I'll just ask you, would you like to talk about them? Um, Chris um, sent some links for a couple different things, some uh, a crate and uh, some other things. I can share the links on the screen if you want. Otherwise, Chris, feel free to talk about those. 
Yeah, so I, I, I forgot what I sent, actually, but we're talking about the bowls, and we sent, um, I think, a buddy bowl. I think, actually, I was private messaging with uh, Joanne Springer. I think they use the same thing, so there's a couple of those things that are out there that um, we found. We also um, really love our um, SUV crates, so uh, that was something Kathy Monger introduced us to. So you guys they fit. Can what? Can you guys see this? I have the. It, I'm just trying to share the link. I don't know if you can see it or not. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So um, SUV crates for traveling with your um, with your dogs. They're perfect. They they fit. You can fit two side by side in um, a minivan or some other small SUV. Um, they're really really awesome. Um, uh, Joni Bernard introduced us to something. If you have a, like we have a forerunner and trying to get our otter hunt in the forerunner is impossible. So there's this twist step that attaches to a hitch, which is really cool to get your dog to step up and not have to jump up and down from a really high, uh, like, you know, tail bed or, um, you know, like a back of your truck. It's really cool. Um, what else is in there? Um, Robin, I, I forgot what else I put in there. Uh, so you have, okay, let's go. So the, the SUV crates you have at first, and then you've got um, a collar in case they ex escape. We can go back to that link. I'll show, I can share the link if you want. Um, at least a five foot fence and the hitch steps. Let me see if I can get those to share. Yeah, that, that that's a twist step. So um, as you all know, like we have an otter hound who's a boy never thought he could do it, but he can clear a four foot fence. So um, we've had to extend our fence to at least five or six feet in some areas. So just um, always good to have a, a fence. And then we also have a, a GPS collar because just to make sure if he ever does get out, um, it's a fee collar. So that's um, an S, you know, it's a, a GPS collar that we can kind of track our dogs all the time. It's kind of like, Think of a Fitbit for dogs, but um, you can kind of set your GPS area and it links to your cell phone and you know if your dog gets out of that, the safe area. These are just all things that we've sort of stumbled upon over the last couple, couple of years that have been really cool. Is it a fit bark? It, yeah, it's a fit, it's a fit collar. I think it's not a fit bark, but it's a fee. It's F-I, fee mm -hmm. is the one we have. There's a couple different ones, but this is a really good one. Yep. Um, it's it's a real high quality collar and it's um, really like a Fitbit for your dog. It's it's really cool. Um, he... There's a there's a monthly fee because it connects to the cell towers. I think it's like maybe ten dollars a month. Yeah, that's it right there. Um, but we're, we're always really concerned about our dogs getting out of our fenced area. So. And some of them are escape artists. Our, ours are not diggers, but they're jumpers. <laughs> so they'll jump. Oh, can I ask, what's an SUV crate? So an SUV crate is, um, it's a, it's, it's the same height as a normal 40 by, I think 40 by 24 by 30 crate, but it's a little bit thinner. Like, so the, so, so the width is, I forgot what it is. It might be, I'd have to measure it, but I think it's like a 20, maybe a 24 inch width. So you, you can fit two side by side um, and they fit like literally perfectly in the back of an SUV mm -hmm. or um, a, a, a minivan side by side. So in our, in our Odyssey, we could probably get, yeah, it's right there. Okay. We could probably get three or four of these in our minivan. <laughs> so they're 21 inches wide. Yep. There should be a picture, Robin, of them in the SUV side by side. One of them. Oh, yeah, there it is. Right there. Yep. So, you know, Kathy Monger had these in her, um, I think her minivan. I'm like, wow, that is so cool. So we have four otter hounds right now. So this is a very useful way to, you know, travel with them safely. I, I agree. I'm really lucky. I can fit two 500 berry kennels in my van. Um, my concern and it's hopefully never a problem, but if anything happens, I feel the very kennels are more solid than the wire crates. So it's just something to think about too, when you're looking at crates and what fits in your van best. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And then this is the other thing that you shared is the um, Ryobi fans from Home Depot. Oh, we use these as well. I love that fan, especially at dog shows. Yeah, it's great for dog shows. Uh, battery lasts several hours. Um, they're, they're the best fan that we've found to you know, travel with in the summertime. Well, and um, speaking about uh, beards, I actually use a Ryobi fan when I'm grooming out the dogs right before they go in the ring. And it's not to dry them out or anything, but I shoot it at the highest speed right at their face <laughs> so that their beard stays as dry as it can for as long as it can, especially in the hot summer shows. And the, those Ryobis are nice because they're either battery or you can plug them in if you have power at your setup. Yeah, that's what's really cool about them, yeah. They also clip onto the crate. Yeah. They have little hooks on them that you can, uh, right here on the bottom, on that little bottom leg, that clips onto a crate really well. Yeah, it's like the teeniest, tiniest hook. I was at a show with Nancy and hanging the fans and she's like, I didn't know my fans could do that. But it's like the tiniest little gray hook. Like, I don't even think it shows. It's on the bottom leg, like on this, on this picture, if you can see it, it's, it's where the, it would be on the floor in this picture has a yeah. little hook. But yeah, that, that hooks on the crate. Um, takes a little bit of wiggling, but pretty easily. But yeah, we like those a lot. That was the other thing on your list. I like that step, Chris. Yes, we just found out about that from Johnny Bernard not too mm -hmm. long ago. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I'm shopping. And I, um, hey. when I send out the thanks for coming um, email, I'll include all of those links. Um, so does, everybody has I, them. I, does anybody use like those collapsible steps for getting in and out of their vehicles rather than a ramp? Our, none of our dogs are really fond of the ramps, but uh, I've, I've so, seen like I've seen like the collapsible steps, and I'm wondering if anybody has used those and how they work. Not me, but um, Wookie and Harry, my uh, uh, my owners, got them those soft collapsible steps, and I mean, you know, the boy is two and a little bit so he flies up i wouldn't say he walks up those steps but wookie is about six and she walks up them so it works i i mean i don't know how well or not well my dogs would be very confused because it's not a solid step does that make sense i mean it's it's yeah. it's it's fabric so it gives and my dogs are not good with any surface surface that gives but if you get them used to it when they're young or if they don't care about surfaces, right, it might work. And it's definitely very light. So Yeah, the ones I've seen like online, are, are they aren't fabric. They look metal and they just like fold flat or maybe like, not flat, oh, but like into telescope. like a block and then they telescope out and it'll be depending on what height you get, it'll be three or four steps. And the reason I'm asking is because as the dogs get older, those ramps can be too steep and and this? Yes. Kind of, yeah. Yes. Haven't tried them, but it looks solid. Yeah. I was just wondering if anybody had because I'm not happy with the ramps. Not none of the dogs seem to like them. And and uh, I mean most of them can just hop in, but as they get older, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's funny because we just um, bought a golf cart for out here and <laughs> I was trying to hoist, you know, an otter hound up in the back and I was, and so one of the guys here at the park that works here said, you know, I've got a ramp and I thought, well, we have a ramp back in Colorado, but that's not going to do us any good. So um, General's just like, this is the best thing ever. And we just go up ladder and he's like, okay, I know what that means. And so knock on wood, we haven't had a problem with the ramp being too steep, but I, I hear exactly what you're saying that the older we get, he might go, that's just a little too up and down for me to go on. So it's nice to know about those steps. I like that hatch thing. 
-hmm. My minivan is fairly low to the ground, but with Ozzy's rear being moody at his senior age, that little step will give him a little break there. So I like it a lot. Huh. I'll include the links in the um, in the email with the recording um, link. Um, anybody else have any other questions or stuff they want to share? So um, I'll ask a question to the great otter hound minds that are here. Uh, my youngest otter hound, Pop, is uh, loves to go places once we're there and everything, but she gets so darn car sick. <sighs> I mean, our confirmation class that we go to every once in a while is literally five minutes away. And the bottom of her crate is full of drool by the time we get there. Um, she's happy as can be once we're there and inside. And it's not like she she willingly jumps into her crate in the van. So it's not like she's afraid to go. Um, I've tried the feeding before, not feeding before. That th The only difference is whether or not I see kibble at the end of the car ride <laughs> in the bottom of her crate. So... Um, I was wondering, I, I know people have tried like different things, but anything I've tried, like it was, it wasn't Dramamine. It was some, it was another something like that. And it, it didn't do it any, any right. good. Is it emotion sickness or is it anxiety? So I, I never believed it until that dog happened to me, kind of. Um, I had a puppy that just, I mean, she would slobber before we left the garage. But what I realized one time, I forgot my wallet in the house and she was in the car. The car was not moving. I left her in the car. I ran into the house. I came back and, and she just, I mean, she was just so anxious. So it wasn't really emotion. It was just the fact that she was in the car. Oh, no, Pop loves to go. She oh. like, willingly run my car if i wow. tell her to go so i don't know i don't i've no i've tried the cracking the windows down that have part. you tried like a thunder shirt or any of those like wraps or anything or i could try that um i mean i i, I don't, i'm just offering we've, ideas i don't we've had a lot of julie dogs um most of it is anxiety I don't think any of them, it was really the motion itself. It was all anxiety where they don't even want to get by the van, let alone get in it. And then they're just soaking wet when you get there. And we've tried everything. We've tried boning. We've tried ginger. We've tried, you know, all kinds yeah. of stuff That's that better. none of it worked. But yeah. what, what we did, especially with our show dogs where they had to go, there was no options. Um, we put a sweatshirt on her and that a human sweatshirt. And that absorbed all of the drool. And then you could just peel it off and she was dry underneath. And right. then we put a new sweatshirt on her to go home. And that made her happier and us happier. And it was a lot easier to show a dog because she's not soaking wet full of saliva. Right. You have Because we'd have to bathe her whole front and dry her whole front before you could even think about getting her in the ring. So that sweatshirt uh, thing worked good. We used that, that for her whole show career. And some of her offspring... Um, have been like that as well and they're still like sweatshirt kids at six years old that's so that, that we we had yeah. the best luck with I, I'm working on some opportunities where she'll actually be able to come to work with me once or twice a week and I really don't want to walk her into my work covered right. in yeah, dr <laughs> yeah. I the heard about those collars um the adaptive collars yes I use those um, when Penny was pregnant on recommendation from the vet. I didn't see a difference. I can try it on Pop though. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't either. We have that little thunder shirt with the patch where you can put the adaptal on it. Um, I had the infuser next to her crate. Yeah. yeah. The, um, and I will say though, that with that particular dog, when we would drive to Minnesota, and that is an 18 hour plus drive, by the time she got there, she was usually done. And by the time, because we would take her everywhere every day. So by 18 hours, she was done being anxious and then driving back and forth every day, she was fine and driving home, she was fine. But I'd have to say for the first 10 hours, she was a drooly mess. 
What yeah. helped her also was we put that uh, memory foam mattress topper on the floor of the van, and that made the biggest difference. Yeah, you're right. We had we had a mattress, you know, like a four inch memory foam mattress topper, and when we got a new bed, we we're like, well, we don't need this anymore, and we cut we cut it so it fit in the the van, and once that was in there, she was much better. Hmm. So we have like dog beds now in the van and it helps. Well, it's what a vibration. Right. Yeah, what I would, just, yeah, it's the low center of gravity too. Yeah. Um, which is if you transport on the seat, it's too high. So I would transport that particular puppy on the front seat on the floor because it was contained low to the ground area. Plus it was right. my human car, so. She couldn't, well, you know, I could secure it from puking and stuff. What I have noticed is she still drools, but it's a lot less when she's in the back of my mom's minivan in one of the Airedale crates in the back of the minivan compared to my uh, Dodge Journey with a crate that shoves, you know, sideways into the back seat. Um, so maybe she doesn't like sitting sideways. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, she's almost two and I have tried. So I just bring handfuls of towels and wipe her out and brush her out before she goes in anywhere. I well, think air the blowing on them can help. Sweater idea is great. The what? Clean. Yeah, the sweatshirt. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm gonna have to get her a, a stash of sweatshirts. <laughs> out of desperation. Yeah, that was. I, so I tried to make a towel that would hook, like that I could put around, like put her collar in and then buckle the collar around her. That was just like a big bib with sleeves, and. Um, that was kind of a fail. Um, so that led to sweatshirts. And so we never threw away a sweatshirt from that point on. <laughs> from that point on, if we were done with it, it was the dog sweatshirt that lived in the car. And right. If you want a cheap sweatshirt, go to the Goodwill and get a bunch yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good idea. I'll have to try that. She yeah. loves, the bad part is she loves to go, but nobody wants to pet like a drenched dog full of drool. <laughs> I have no. a couple of thoughts. Um, first one is, have you tried rescue remedy for dogs? That that does help with anti-anxiety. Um, it's plant-based, it's holistic. Uh, it doesn't interfere with anything. A couple of drops uh, under the tongue, if you can get it there uh, or in some water um, that morning before you go off and, and travel. And then mm -hmm. the thing about thunder shirts is, um, you know, hearkening back to storms, mm -hmm. I never bought a thunder shirt, but Barley was, he, he was so affected by um, anything that was either a storm. And unfortunately, as the crow flies, I lived just a few miles from Six Flags and they would do fireworks like Disneyland does every weekend and he would have heart failure. What I ended up doing was taking um, a couple of my own t-shirts. He had a big chest and <laughs> I would wear them and not wash them um, so that they would have my scent. And then I would put them on him um, and they were tight around his chest because he had a really deep chest. And that would calm him down so much. And I would say, you know, do you want your shirt on? Do you want your shirt? And he knew where I kept it. And I will say I didn't wash it in between. Um, he would go over to the drawer in a little cabinet that I have. And he would stand there and wait for me to put it on him. And it would calm him down at least 70 to 80 percent, if not more. Huh. Well, for thunders, um, I experimented or recently started experimenting with essential oils. And I have to say that lavender did help my Rachel several times in thunder uh, uh, thunderstorm situation, just on my hands, on the ears and on the chest. And she went right to sleep. I don't know if it would work in the car, but if you have anything like a diffuser collar or something, it doesn't hurt to try. She did all good when she got there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so. we'll have to try that. 
Yeah, it's lavender. And if lavender doesn't work, you can uh, text Cindy. She is the magician with the oil mixtures and blends. Okay. So she has more intel. I stopped at lavender because it worked. Okay. I'll try that. Oh, good to know. Anybody else have any questions or ideas or stuff that they would like to share? I just wanted to point out that these are expensive brushes. Um, they're over $60, but I don't know if you can see it. It's the uh, Chris Christofferson line <clears throat> um, and they have a bent pin. And they, uh, when, if you have a dog like, like uh, my, my Gable's hair, it is a thick, thick undercoat and a very, very lengthy overcoat. And this goes all the way through. This is where he does let me groom him. Um, and it, it is a great brush and feels wonderful in your hand. It really, and I have a small hand, so it just, it just feels good. I think even with a larger hand, it would work. I have it in two different sizes, one with a smaller, a smaller head to get into the beard. And then another one, um, which is the same brush with further spaced pins, and that's the black handle. Um, I used to be able to buy them at Best in Show at the, at the dog shows, um, but they're also available on, um, on Amazon at the same price. So. Love Groomers sometimes has those too. We use those for the Black Russians. Um, so any, anybody that carries the Chris Christensen uh, line usually has them, but I have seen them on Amazon too. Um, don't spend more than $60 on Amazon though. I saw one one time for like $100 on Amazon and that's overpriced. You can get them for, um, I think 65 on Chris Christensen's site. I'm not positive. It's been a while since we bought ours. Um, they do yeah, last a long time. We don't need ours for Ellie just cause she doesn't have that much coat. We just use a, uh, a regular like gray home comb like for, for Ellie, we use just yeah. like a, with thicker and finer. Right. So that's my favorite comb for Ellie. And like, we just will get like leaves and debris out with just a regular <laughs> pin brush. And then for like, not getting stuff out or just for like grooming for like, I guess this is in our show bag. I don't use this as an everyday brush for her but that's the brush we use on Ellie, but she does not have the coat that Gable in general have. Um, her coat is not, not um, thick like that. It's more, I guess I would call it typical otter home, but that might be a wrong choice of words. So are not uh, big fans of the slicker brush. No. I think it's because the it, it are a little bit too pointy. So I would only use it for like finishing before going to the ring when there's no mats, nothing. I just, you know, as I say, pin them out right before they go to the show. But um, they, I like the pin, um, just the regular pin brush with those plastic soft ends at the end. So I usually get the first uh, uh, tangles out with that. And then I follow up with the comb and I do have the Greyhound kind. Um, not the original. I have the cheap version um, because if it breaks, I just get another one. Uh, I can tell you, I can tell you the original Greyhound is a heck of a lot better than the cheap. I have both. Yes, it is. I have I one of those, Greyhound. but I am so terrified that I lose it, that it is in my house, but it definitely doesn't travel to the shelves because I just left too many things behind. Uh, I totally agree, but nothing is better than a Greyhound. Yeah. <laughs> this one's like 15 or 20 years old. I love it. It's my very mm -hmm. favorite comb. And I use that for everybody. And like this one has boar, boar's hair in the interspersed with like the plastic bristles. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see that. But that one works really well too. And then, and the slicker brush has got soft bristles. So the softer and longer tend to be nicer for mm -hmm. their coats just because they're not as stiff and prickly the only other thing i have that i like a lot for all of our dogs especially strong pullers is we have a leash that has like a bungee in it 
And that is like a shoulder saver for a puller. And it's made by Easy Dog. We've been using these for about 14, 15 years. And that's my very favorite leash for all of my pullers. It's still short enough where you don't lose control and it has just enough give where it doesn't pull out your pull your shoulder out of the socket. So that was my other thing I wanted to share. What's the company? It's Easy Y, Easy Dog, D-O-G. I have the link, I'll have, I can put it in the, uh, they have all kinds of harnesses and all different kinds of leashes. This one is called um, um, Zero, what is it called, Charlie? Zero, it has the word zero in it. I have no idea, I'm not, I don't, Robin likes those leashes. I, I like a leather one. They're just more comfortable on my hand. Yeah, he uses a six foot leather one. I, I don't like a six foot leather one. I like my easy dog one. Here, I can tell you what the name of it is real quick. Um, zero Shock, it's called. So it's Easy Dog Zero Shock. And they have all different kinds. They have um, running leashes and waist leashes and all different kinds. But it's Zero Shock. And they come in all different colors. You can get them solid colors or... And they have matching stuff too. Like if you wanted a matching collar or a matching harness or whatever. Um, they have all of that kind of stuff too. So that's my favorite leash. Charlie's favorite is a six foot leather like really nice leather leash from uh, from uh, Learberg working can dogs. I ask, sorry, can I ask a question just since you're on leashes? Um, you do you any questions as you want. Okay, do you prefer harnesses or halties? What, what do you find works best? I think that uh, depends on the dog. I think we might all have different answers to that one, Katie. Yeah, um, I actually use either a, a halty or a gentle leader. There's two main companies that I see sell them right now. Um, the benefit of, so I actually prefer the fit of a um, gentle leader, but I like the safety strap of a halty. So I took it apart and made my own. Oh, because uh, so I like sell them. <laughs> yeah. So I like that I can get a safety strap that'll hook from the halty to their collar, especially because I do a lot of camping and hiking. So I really don't want them to get away from me. Yeah. Where head harnesses can slip off their head if they pull right. just right oh, and yeah. just enough. Um, but ideally you've done enough training leading up to that that they're not gonna come out. But this safety strap is like a lifesaver because if they pull out of this part, you you still have an attachment to their their collar. Yeah, we have the, we have the halty that we attach to their um, attach to his harness because yeah. we put his harness on too. Just for that reason, we're scared if it's on his collar that you know, so if he pulled out of it, we're just freaked. So we just attach it to. Him. But we just use the halty just because he's he's really good walking. If there's no nothing going on, he's really mm -hmm. good. At those commands um but yeah if there's a person or a car goes by right he just pulls right towards it and he's so strong so as i had my first litter of puppies i was really interested in being able to start training a puppy that i was going to keep from the time they were like you know little nuggets and mm -hmm. i actually started pop on this actual head piece that i made um when she was like six weeks old and i can tell you the leash breaking and training and everything has been 10 times easier because i was able to start what i what the kind of training i like to do with them when yeah. they're that, starting them right away with those we use them on the airedales too it, it's mm -hmm. a game changer. i have a friend with an american foxhound here and i'm actually going tomorrow to help her fit one so it's That's it's a good idea her for large males that need to remember that there's someone attached to the other end of them. Yeah, yeah, we started them with a harness um, and then as he got really big, it's like, holy smokes, <laughs> we got to get him something. And then we broke down and got him a halty, but he still can pull with that. Like if he decides yeah. that he's got to do something and he's I, pretty strong willed that way. And, <laughs> and I've 
mixed reviews about those no pull harnesses. I mean, maybe someone here uses them and can shed more light on them. But mm -hmm. I've heard because they pull the shoulders in that if mm -hmm. they're wearing them all the time and they're getting that constant pull, if they pull hard enough, that they can actually damage their shoulders and their shoulder blades. Yeah, I've, I've heard that about some of the harnesses too. The front clip harnesses mainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a back one that's got, what is that harness called? Right? Uh, new tricks, new tricks uh, um, harness, which we find works pretty good when we use them. It, it's on the back, it's on his back and it, um, and it just pulls. No, the harness. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the front clip harnesses. Mm -hmm. um, the ones on the back, uh, they will, with a male, they will win that battle if they want to pull. Mm -hmm. Because they pull with their chest. Yeah. And, and they're, well, they're definitely stronger than me, but, uh, me you too. know, <laughs> you, you just don't have any control if it hooks in the back. No. In the front, exactly. if you correct, they will lose balance and they have to turn to you. I, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. I, I would have to see some data about the shoulder damage. Uh, but the way I use my, uh, my front clip harness is that I use it with the training. So yeah. my dogs well, have the martingale, so I can, you know, if I need them short to me, I can grab it because martingale has that handle. Mm. And then I like to tell my dogs when they are at the distance. So at the, at the I use flexi leads that some people hate, but I use them and I love them. Um, so when I know that they're towards the end of the flexi, I just tell them to slow down or come back to me. So I'm trying to minimize that yanking of that front harness. Right, and I would say a lot of it, Ashka, probably does come down to the user. Um, right. I had that before, and then I was actually at a show helping someone with their start their Airedale and confirmation. And I knew other people in the breed ring and they came up to me and said, you know, she moved so funny. It looked like she was so restrained in the front. Mm -hmm. And we look over and the lady is fighting with her with this harness and you can see her shoulders curling in. Mm -hmm. Like that's all the dog had ever known. And mm -hmm. so I, I don't, I don't have data on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard it and then I saw it in that one case. Yeah. That's not real evidence, but. For, well, for like the just front going on is the only thing that worked for my boy. My Oz is, um, you know, his perfect weight is 115 pounds. He's been 120 oh. for a short period of times. Right now he's 118 and he is solid. And if he wants to go, he's oh, yeah. going to go. And, you know, for, for yeah, just going on a, go a ahead. walk or something, I kind of like a prong collar. We'll put a, a prong collar on Ellie and one little correction and she just doesn't pull anymore. Right. Not she, with Oz. Oz in his prime at three years old, I tried prong and it would work if he was eh, interested. But when he was really interested, oh. he would pull like med and prong would not stop him at all. A um, couple of times it, I had scratches on his skin because he was pulling so hard mm -hmm. and even the coat around the neck mm -hmm. did not stop, you know, that, that yeah. prong going yeah. through. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree with Ashka on the uh, prong collar too. I tried it once and uh, on a male and I was really afraid it was going to puncture his uh, mm -hmm. skin. So but, he never went on with a prong collar ever again. Ellie, yeah, you know, you put it on and she, if, if you use like just a, a, a pinch collar or a harness, she's going to pull, but the prong collar, she just keeps your pace. She'll be at the end of the lead, but she's not pulling. And that's all I care about. Yeah. Right. Or she, she just is so oblivious to everything else around her. Her nose is just on the ground and sniffing. And, and she's oblivious girls, to everything. I, I, my experience with girls versus boys is that Oz is much more determined. So it means if he wants it, he really wants it. If he's eh, then he'll cooperate, right? With girls, I can negotiate and the hard, harder correction is more effective. 
I haven't tried the prongs, but I suspect that if I used it, they'd be like, oh, okay, I guess I need to comply. With us, if he wants it, okay. it doesn't matter what I have. So Merlin, I'm just, yeah, I'm gonna say we're just plain old school at our house. I don't like harnesses on the dogs. Mm -hmm. I, I never have, be it in the front or the top. We are standard choke collars. We've got the nice leather choke collars. Our kids from day one kind of learn how to walk on those collars and I can take them anywhere. I don't have to worry about them. Um, I, if I ever have a problem, I do a prong a couple of times and they, I mean, you really have to stay on them to yeah. say, no, that's not good behavior. And so I'm just not a harness person. Um, and now for tracking, you know, that's a whole different ball game. And they know that that's for work, but we just use our regular choke collars and people are like, well, that's so mean if they pull. I was like, but my dogs don't pull, you know, right. they know they could put their little noses down and walk around but yeah so but i'm Sarah, just i'm you, old school yeah that's the magic of the choke collar so i do agree i do agree that if i was using like show lead kind of chain choke which we use in not just in confirmation but some other occasions it will work it will absolutely work that is true and um, i would I keep, a, I keep a, a show collar on gable all the time um and um, he's very compliant with it. Um, you know, when we used to go to shows, we'd walk, walk all over with just that. But when we go for a walk, I do use a prong collar and he's very responsive to it. But he's got this thick coat around his neck. So it's pressure that he feels and not necessarily the pinch of the prong. But it is the only thing that I can use to control him, especially if there might be another dog that's um, not making me comfortable approaching. Um, I need to have that control. And without, without having um, that added mechanical advantage, advantage, I think I would be on the ground. Mm -hmm. so it, works, yes. it works for me. And he knows when, when we put it on, we're going for a walk. We're going for a good time. The rest of the time, I just use uh, a regular leash with him. And I would say too, I've done some training, especially with our terriers with prong collars, and they're not all the same. Like what you buy at a regular, most regular chain pet stores or at like the grocery store, those giant thick prongs aren't what most professional trainers that use yeah. prong collars would use. They use the Herm Springers and well, it's I actually... Do. Right. multiple prongs that are actually pretty short you can get them longer if you have a dog right. with a long coat but those giant claws that everyone imagines aren't what most people in the dog community are using you, you know and if if you're concerned about it you can also get like rubber tipped ones where they, it's a metal prong but it's got like a rubber tip on it too it's and, so and they, but plastic too you can get ones that are just plastic yeah Same way around and and the ones we have the prongs are short yeah they're really it's a smart. pretty collar yeah, yeah. There, there it is it's, yeah. it's a pretty collar so nobody even knows you're using it oh yeah those are the ones that they call it shows the cheater collars yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so when and, ellie needs when ellie needs to be good on a, a leash and you know where it's like a dangerous thing or like if we we're at a rest area or something like that this is what we'll use because once she realizes she has this on, it's not even an issue. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't even, you don't even really need to correct her. She no. just knows. Once you no. put it on her, she's like, oh, got it. Okay. And, and our, old our old black Russian, Boris, that's how we started training him with was, was one of those. And he'd get excited when you get the prong collar out. He's like, oh boy, we get to work. You know, mm -hmm. so it, it's weird because we had a, what, depending on what we were doing was that was what kind of collar went on him if we were doing mm -hmm. obedience work you got the prong collar and if we were doing like practicing for the show ring you got a show collar so you kind of know oh we're going to do this now depending on what kind of collar you put on him but like you put that on ellie and she's 
she's a different dog than like just on a, a regular collar or even a harness. And it really she pulls with on, a harness. Yeah, and it depends on the disposition of the dog a lot. Like over our history of dogs, we've had a dog that if you put a prong collar on her, she got hurt, like not hurt physically, but like she'd look at you like, was that necessary? I mean, she would really be like, put off by that she'd be like okay and I, I get your point you can take that off now and never use it again um and then we've had other dogs where you know it took way more correction with some dogs to get the same result as like hardly any correction with others just depending on their temperament and disposition some were very compliant and some are like no you can kill me but I'm not going to do what you want so and I also is I running. also think that people don't always know how to use correctly a prong collar, meaning that it's not to hold on to your dear life while the dog is pulling. No, it needs to quick be correction. correction. Right, right. So um, that makes the difference too. Uh, yeah. Other people, I mean, and they aren't for all the time. So we, we've no. seen people that that's the collar the dog has on all the time. It's like, no, that's just for when you're like, walking them or training them or something they, they shouldn't be wearing that laying around the house no and it's like some people never took them off it, it's like that's the wrong wrong thing they're considered so, a training collar so um if your dog isn't in training it's inappropriate to put it on them you know training even when you're just taking a walk you're still you're you're educating them that this is the appropriate behavior for this walk but to keep it on all the time would be cruel right so one thing uh, an observation i made is the barn hunt association for the longest time said you weren't allowed to use prongs even the hidden prongs like what ellie wears um and i would say there were sometimes because those dogs can get really charged up to do what they're about to do um they actually change it so you can wear a hidden prong now as long as it has some sort of the covering on it. And the behavior of the dogs is a thousand times better because they suddenly know yeah. that if they go charge at another dog who's gonna touch their rat or go before them or whatever, that that's just not gonna be an acceptable thing. Yeah, they have a place definitely. And and definitely you, ha you do have to know how to use them and, uh, that makes a huge difference as well. Who else has something to share? I do. I have a question for Marilyn. I have one of those brushes and I cannot get it through her coat and she does not have a lot of fur. So I am I holding it wrong? The, <laughs> I mean, what am I doing wrong? Um, try it in layers, going from lower first, and then, you know, let the next layer come down. Yeah, 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 which is how I always brush, but it gets like stuck in her fur. Well, are you doing it so that the angle of the pin okay. is down, not up? Yeah. Um, I can't help you. <laughs> no, I can help any grooming. Challenge. Okay. <laughs> I will say it does help um, when uh, when they're when when they're freshly bathed, and I'm blowing them out. I use I use a good high speed um, blower that is not hot. It's just you know, warm air. Um, so and and I've you and I use a little spray conditioner on on the fur first and use it and it goes through pretty much like butter it's really uh, i've never had a problem with it and i was I, i've only used it problem. on dry hair um, I, I wouldn't use it on wet really yeah. I, I, unless yeah. you really know what you're doing because you're gonna um yeah i don't know what i'm doing hair out so i wait i let them air dry mm. and then i use the blower and then as it's dry then I brush because that's the fresh time to brush it, especially when they're um, when they're clean and there isn't a lot of obstruction in the in the in the coat itself, just from crusted on dirt and stuff. But so, 
Sherry, they call it line brushing is what, you know, all the Afghan people do. And I would say, I would love to see your dog's undercoat because there is, and I don't mean to sound unkind, but there's really no reason why it wouldn't go through. Mm -hmm. And again, as Marilyn was saying, if you start, let's going to, we're just going to say like on the hip, start low mm -hmm. and lift it all up and really bring it down. But there is no reason why that shouldn't go through the coat unless that undercoat is matted or really, really, really thick, but even really, really thick because we it's have- It's not thick. Yeah, and see, we have really thick coats. So I'm like going through a real heavy cushion, but really make sure you're pulling it up and doing just a little bit I had a judge come by one time at a show and say, why are you line brushing that dog? It's like, well, because they've got two coats. Um, you know, they were just blown away because this person was an Afghan person, but really on the belly, start at the bottom and lift. So again, if you're saying your dog doesn't have a thick coat, I, I, I wonder if you're, um, uh, uh, teeth aren't long enough that does that make sense because I have like a slicker that has really short teeth it's kind of like Ashka was talking about that final you mm -hmm. know I wouldn't do a complete groom but one of those that has good lengthy teeth and um, oh poor and Barbara's it, Barbara's being happens, mauled by an otter hand call 911 um, if you have this brush in particular I do it yeah. does have a much longer pin and yeah it's real long. That angle is really what makes all the difference because it, yeah. you kind of curve into it and as you're brushing down that's when the longer part of the pin actually does its work yeah so i'm not holding it right i don't think i i wonder so really try that and spend some time you know lifting and getting mm -hmm. in there and really say, is that up against the dog's skin? Because I have to tell you, there are otter hound people, and I don't mean to be critical, but I see a lot of this, and they brush their dogs, and they go, and they brush, and they go all brushed, and it's like, you haven't even gotten started, because those <laughs> dogs are matted underneath. It's one of my biggest pet peeves, because people just, I, I don't, I, I'm going to just call it, they just kind of haven't been trained on how to really groom a dog, but you've got to get in and groom an otter hound. Okay. And, uh, yeah. When you're done, I had a bad uh, uh, case once where I, an otter hound came out to me and she says, oh, the judge says we don't have enough undercoat. Oh, the judge says, give it time. This dog stunk. This dog, she says, oh, I have to bath the dog every time I show it. She returned the car to the airport. By the time she came back to us, we had used the two of us with two greyhound combs, literally combed out, layer combed out all the undercoat, no more mats, and the dog didn't stink and did right. not need a bath. So, you know, it's the undercoat that needs to come out more than the top coat. Yeah. to keep everything unmatted which is why you want to start right. below the top hairs and at the skin yeah and by parting it like that you can see the skin so when you put if you pull the hair up you see the skin and then you put your comb right there and then pull that layer down until it's comb free and then do the next layer do the same thing so you're actually putting your comb like against the skin so you know you're getting every mat between the skin down and then keep moving up as you go. And, and that's that's really, in my opinion, the only way to know that your dog is mat free when you're done is by doing that from top to bottom and line coning them like that. What what I actually do is the, the comb, the metal comb, and I go through to get all that undercoat out. And then for the top, I use a short, uh, I don't know what do you wanna call those, a little short, like a brush, but it's really short. So it's not going deep because I've already gone deep right. with the comb. Yeah, the, the only thing, I, you know, I really use a brush for is just like getting the top, the debris out of their fur when they've been out rolling around in the yard. 
So before they come in, a quick slicker brush of them, but for, for getting down deep, it, you got to use a comb. The comb. Yep. Anybody else have any questions or something they want to share? Sherry, I Sherry, I'm happy to because I'm a grooming freak. I love grooming dogs and other people's dogs and it's just one of the things I enjoy doing and I'm happy to even you know like in an evening a Saturday Sunday if you and I don't know if you've got a grooming table and just to kind of say okay here's what I would do with the dog um, if it were at my house here's what I would be doing because I, I really enjoy doing that and I enjoy helping people, you know, really presenting the best otter hound appearance that they can. And that, like I say, there are just some people who don't understand kind of about going through the whole coat and that nothing makes me crazier than people that take an otter hound in the ring with mats. I just, I can't do it. And I just, I, I find myself starting to kind of shake. It's like, oh, why did I do that? Um, and everybody has been around me at the shows and knows that I'm just like kind of over the top about that. So, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to help if you ever just, you know, want to do a FaceTime, whatever it is. So. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You um, bet. Yeah, I'll have to get your contact information to do that. Well, um, Robin can include that when. Yeah, so yeah. what I'll do when I, so when you come to an honor talk, I always send you a thanks for coming email that also has the link to the YouTube video and any links to, uh, like on honor talks where we talk about stuff like we did tonight, I'll include all of those links in the email. So if you want to reply to all um, or just make a note to Sarah um, on that or like on that specific one, if you want to like, share something else like say we finished the otter talk and you thought mm -hmm. oh i should have told them about this you can um do it on that email too and and send it to everybody so feel free to do that um that'll be a good way to um, reach out if you have any additional questions or if you have any additional items that you want to share with everybody okay anybody else have anything well, I I want to negotiating you. for dinner here I want to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate thank it. Um, it's going to go on the YouTube channel and I will um, send you the link when that happens. Um, I just want to put a little plug in for next week's Otter Talk. Um, it's one that we've been waiting for for a long time. It's um, Dr. Star Cameron from the University of Wisconsin is going to give us her presentation on epilepsy and the Fitbit. We had to wait for her research to be published before she could uh, do our Otter Talk. And that is next Thursday the 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So we'd love to have you join us for that one. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.